Okay, welcome to uh, the panel on game journals. Um, I want to introduce ourselves first. I'm uh, Dr. Kent Norman. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland and I teach a course on the psychology of video games. Um, it's not a game design course. It's really a course for those people who have been subjected to the design of bad games uh, and good games over a number of years. Uh, so we look at psychological aspects of video games. And I've got up here as uh, panelists um, a number of students that have worked in my lab to help collect data and analyze game journals. So let me have them introduce themselves to you. Hi, I'm not Dr. Ben Whitlos. Uh, I'm a senior at University of Maryland College Park. I study psych. And uh, I've been, I'm ashamed to say I've been playing Madden Mobile a lot. I used to be uh, a gamer. Uh, I played a lot of World of Warcraft and Skyrim, but I fall apart. Um, I'm interested in uh, human factors. I'm applying to human factors grad programs, and I want to do, yeah, user experience for video games. Uh, my name is Yuchi Wang. Um, I was a former student of Dr. Norman's. Um, we did a research project together on personality and video game genres. I was also a psychology student. Um, right now I'm doing something with my life. Uh, not as awesome as working at a video game lab. Um, that was kind of the highlight of my life. But anyways, uh, I guess I just play random games here and there. I like Kajimari, things like that, I guess. Hi, I'm Caroline. I just graduated from University of Maryland in May, double degree in psychology and anthropology. Um, I've worked in Dr. Norman's lab for about three semesters, and because I was an anthropology major, I got to do a bunch of qualitative analysis, which you'll get to see later. Um, currently, I just finished applying to PhD programs in information science, so I kind of wanted to do designing mobile educational types of things with some game influences in them. And I currently work at the Natural History Museum doing video editing and for the APA doing some test accessioning for site tests. So, fun times. Okay, so the big question that we face in our lab is really uh, how do we relate video game playing to psychology? Are there things that we can understand about people through their habits? Uh, that's what psychologists have been doing for decades and decades. And so it just seemed to us that one of the ways of understanding people is actually by looking at their game playing behaviors. And so the question is really can you know a person, can you find out a per something about a person by understanding and knowing the games that they play? How many people would say, yes, you can find out a lot about a person? Just ask them, like, what game are you playing and you know who they are? Hmm. Uh, in fact, I have this theory that if we understand the games that people play, the sorts of things, that we could actually understand, and we've got some studies that Yuchi was working on, that actually indicates your personality profile, uh, whether you're an extrovert, introvert, uh, conscientious, neurotic, and those sorts of things. So that's kind of the line of research that we're pursuing. But I teach this class called the Psychology of Video Games. Uh, it started eight years ago, and I proposed to the university that we have this course as a registered, regular course in the Department of Psychology. Um, maybe you heard me talk about this before. They immediately said, no, are you kidding? A course in video game playing? And I said, well, look, you've got courses on all these other strange things, the psychology of sports, the psychology of women, the psychology of men, the psychology of the dying. There's a lot of video game players out there. And so some of my students actually wrote uh, to the college about how important this was. And so they gave us a grant for $30,000 to buy gaming equipment and get the course started. And I even have one of the people that I hired, Dustin, raise your hand who helped to develop the course and grab all the materials uh, to start the course. Um, so it's basically upper level undergraduate students. Um, it's getting to be more diverse. I now have 50% females, 50% males in it. Um, good representation of ethnicity. 
It's usually about 36, so it's confined to 36 students because I can't handle more people than that. That's my limit. I'm memorizing people's names for the semester. The classroom size. Yes, the real thing is it only seats 36 students and I request the same class room all the time. It's an electronic classroom so everybody has computers in front of them so they can play video games while I'm lecturing. So computers in front of them that you can control and throw up on the screen. <laughs> yes, I can see what games they're playing actually. Uh, I've taught it eight times now, believe it or not. Um, and during those semesters, one of my conniving ideas is to have assignments that actually add to my database of knowledge about video games. So um, I won't go into all those, but so it's been eight times. And so one of the things that I thought of doing, because we're encouraged to do different sorts of things to, um, in teaching, and one of the things that has been promoted is the idea of journaling. You know, like journal, you know, what your thoughts are through the semester in different site courses and then, then turn those journals in. And so it's kind of like you write down all of these sorts of things and then you have somebody else read them. But this is a journal that's required that they write down all of their uh, video game playing through the, through the week. So I basically have like 284 completed journals over all this time with basically like 3,976 entries. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? all tabulated in spreadsheets and uh, analyzed by these guys. Um, this is actually what the classroom looks like uh, since I got my uh, iPhone with the uh, panorama view. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting group and we have a lot of fun. So journaling is this thing that is useful not only for us you know, to find out information, but it's also something reflective for the students. Did you guys reflect on your journals? They all had to go through this, too. Depends on the game. Yeah. <laughs> Some things, you know, why were you playing Candy Crush? Why were you playing Candy Crush for four hours? <laughs> yeah. So for the journals in these, it was all online, submitted online, so we could see exactly when it was submitted, uh, how it was completed. So they saw basically they had to put in the date and time, the, game, the particular game played, system used, so we could tabulate that as well, reflections on the game, and they got five points if they turned it in on time and got the format. So this is sort of what the game, this is the, the format that we supplied for them. They had to use this format, and if they deviated from it, they would lose a point. Um, so here's some of the oops, some of the sorts of things. Um, this is a rather extensive one playing Destiny, PlayStation 4, 180 minutes, and on through Destiny, 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 Madden. Who was that you? Yeah. It was Destiny. Andy. It was Andy. How long was supposed to play? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I should mention uh, everybody was required to play at least two hours of games a week, um, and we'll get to the point where that's where a lot of people stopped, two hours and that was it. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, some people would go up to, you know, 400, 700, <laughs> thousand minutes, during the week. Yeah, but he is minutes. Yeah, yeah we use minutes. <laughs> Not a thousand hours in the week. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so here's like a sequence of Candy Crush, and so five points. They also put in this, the number of sessions that they, um, went through and the number of different games. Okay, here's Sims free play, things like that. Okay, so first, um, before, you know, before everybody leaves, bore you with a bunch of statistical analyses of this. This is what I do, this is what Ben does, this is what Eugene does. We do, we crunch the numbers, um, and then we're gonna have the more delightful part from Caroline, the color analysis. Okay, so our questions really are things like, you know, first of all, um, let me have, I guess throw this out to you to make it a little more interactive. Um, how, many, how many of you have played an Xbox 361 game this last week? Okay, 
So, um, PlayStation, three or four people. Okay. Um, how many PC players? Okay. <laughs> Big number. Um, mobile devices. Okay. Almost the same. Um, that would be like smartphone. I guess handheld gaming, DS's. How about just DS's? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then we get to how many play people play or played over two hours? Okay. Over four hours. Okay. Six hours. Right it up. Ten hours. Okay. We're losing some people. Twenty hours. How many people are still up there? Twenty hours. Thirty hours. <laughs> Forty hours. Okay. All right. Okay, we got a forty. Yes. <laughs> so this is your job. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, how many just played one game this last week? Two games. Three different games. Let's say three to five. Five or more? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is, now we, I'm gonna turn back to the, um, to our actual students. You have to remember these are college students. These are mostly juniors and seniors. They survived their way through the University of Maryland up to this point. And so somehow they didn't drop out because they were playing World of Warcraft has happened. Um, so we're going to look at the amount of time, um, the number of sessions over the 14 week. Basically, we find a decrease. So we're kind of, you know, what's going on here? What happens? You know, it's kind of, what happens? Right, well, I mean, the trend was pretty clear. Uh, general decrease over the course of the semester, and you can kind of assume I guess a variety of reasons why that might be the main one being that you get more work over the course of the semester. Things get harder. You have exams like the uh, five, six uh, week drop. That is exactly uh, the first exam week in three exam courses. Uh, but what's kind of weird is that I guess the uh, jump after or around week 11 is right after exam two. That's kind of fun. So it's kind of like after you've gone through the stress, you're like, all right, I'm only going to game now. This is my life, which is what I did. <laughs> All right, so we uh, had this, uh, at the beginning of the course, you uh, took the survey where you rated out of 10 how much uh, game knowledge you thought you had just in general, uh, based on experience, uh, like how, how well you thought you understood games, uh, and then how much time you felt you spent, it was very subjective, playing games is out of 10. So like if you thought you spent, uh, you gamed all the time, you might give yourself like a 9 or 10. So then we distinguish casuals from gamers, uh, giving uh, gamers, uh, or gamers give themselves a rating uh, average of 7 or greater, and then casuals were less. So of course you, uh, you would expect gamers to play significantly more than uh, people who are casuals, and that was true. Um, what was interesting was it seemed that the gamers were more affected by the workload, because they played more, there was more room to drop. So it was much more significant uh, how their gaming habits changed over the course of the semester, whereas you can see the casuals only decreased a little bit because they weren't playing at like an unsustainable level anyway. So that's kind of maintain it. These, these graphs are averaged over the eight, uh, eight different classes. So I wanted yeah, to yeah. just put this last semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was intense. <laughs> And the same thing for the casual gamers. I mean, they're just not affected. They're just doing their little over two hours. But then there was the Destiny launch. It was, it was at the point where you weren't an outlier if you were logging like 800, 1,000 hours then. And typically it's like there's one guy who does that occasionally. But Destiny, after it came out, it was like half the class, not half the class, but a significant portion of the class was just completely zoned in on the game. That's all anyone talked about. Yeah. But for Thanksgiving, that hit everyone. Uh, even the casuals, because he went home and he played, I don't know. I played on the GameCube with my little brother. He was like, I had time now, so I could do that. Uh, so that was interesting. And you could see how much harder the uh, Thanksgiving break hit uh, people who were gamers as opposed to casuals, because now I have the time again. Just punch it. 
Yeah, we looked at uh, the number of average sessions um, during the week and, you know, kind of the same thing. Just kind of that drop. Uh, number of games, drop. We looked at uh, the differences between, within our course, uh, male and female gaming habits. And so the only, I guess the number of games was, was significant, but it was the time uh, that you spent gaming uh, for, for men was significantly greater, like a lot greater, like nearly, uh, well, slightly less than two hours uh, per week, because uh, you were uh, required 120 anyway, so anything over that is really what matters. Yeah, so. um, thank you, Luke. Uh, short, uh, short lesson in statistics, since I've got a little audience here. I used to teach statistics a lot. The P less than means that the probability of this uh, difference occurring by chance is like less than a gazillion. Um, it's actually small, it's smaller, right? So, right, the odds of the difference being due to random chance are incredibly small, which is why we can say it's not just you know, occurring and it can be any. Uh, so anyway, uh, what was kind of interesting was even though the uh, time was greater for the males you know, with regard to how much time they spent playing on average per week, uh, females, even though it wasn't significant, uh, spent more time playing uh, or, or, or uh, played more game sessions. And for me, or at least what I anecdotally noticed, was it, was, uh, it seemed like uh, the girls who I talked to were playing more mobile games. So you would play for shorter bursts, and then I started doing that too. So I probably messed with the male data. But it was a trend uh, that was because, well, what we found was that, uh, I guess it's later, but um, males were more likely to be hardcore gamers. And being a casual gamer, you'd probably be more likely to uh, play mobile games. So then you're probably not going to sit on your phone for four straight hours. You might, but you're probably more likely to spend four hours on your Xbox. So it's session-wise, if you only have a certain amount of time to play. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so then, we saw it before, but uh, gamers spend way more time, significantly, statistically significantly more time playing uh, games um, than casuals to a huge degree. But, uh, these sessions and number of games were not uh, significantly different, which was cool. So it means that you weren't like sitting down to play games more often. You weren't like layering it up all the time. But when you did play, which was the same amount, you sat down for much longer, like nearly double, twice as long. It's cool. Right. So this is this kind of a cool opportunity that educators have is we also give them exams. And so there were two exams, a midterm and a final exam. These were multiple choice questions uh, and essay questions. And so I kept wondering, you know, so are gamers, like, do they know more about gaming and they'll be more involved in the course so they'll have higher scores on the exams because they're gamers? Or because they're gamers, are they spending less time studying because they're playing games? What's the correlation, the relationship between amount of time gaming and uh, test scores, exam scores. So what do you think? Is it going to be positive? How many people think positive? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Negative? Mm. Zero? Mm. What do you think parents think? <laughs> negative. Negative. Yeah, they, they definitely say it would be negative because they've been observing their kids, you know, they're playing these games, and they're not doing as well in school, et cetera. So, um, so I'm gonna show you the results by semester. And so the original, this was like the first, my first look, the first semester, yes, it's negative. This is really a bad thing. <laughs> this is terrible, video games are, Playing video games are leading, and how can this be? I'm a great teacher, I mean, you're excited in this course, what's going on? Next semester, it uh, was just slightly negative, not significant. Next semester, it was slightly positive. And then finally, it's still negative. Four years of teaching this course, and it's still just not there. Most of you people are right, it's negative. Then it turned positive in, uh, 2011, it turned zero in 2012, and then negative again 
and then this last semester, triumph. It was I take positive. Credit for that. That was on me. Yeah. Um, but then I started looking back at what's driving the correlation. It's called outliers. See that guy up there, 1,000, low score. <laughs> it was his fault. <laughs> Nor you already didn't teach him the course material. I even checked. It was a guy. Um, same thing. Because actually what you see is a lot of these points are at the 12200 one level and what's really driving these correlations are those few people that are playing a lot more hours during the semester. So it really is just kind of a function of where those guys are falling uh, in terms of their test scores. So my challenge is to get gamers to study harder so I can get those higher correlations. <laughs> Yes? Um, it's been a few years since I've taken the statistics course. But if I remember correctly, there is a technique where you like throw off the top and bottom 5%. Yes, yes. In order to sort of normalize it so right. your outliers don't affect your. your That's correct. Um, That's absolutely correct. Right. And, well, and I, I presume your statistics person did some of that normalization stuff. What kind, yeah. of, what kind of responses did you get? Okay, did that? if you do that, you get the zero correlation. Uh, yeah, absolutely, you get the zero correlation. So but, it's, but, having said, rely on it but having said that, there's also some statisticians who would say those outliers shouldn't be thrown out because they're important people. Right. Now, the census, you know, would differ there. I mean, you know. They're going to throw data. And so it really depends on your perspective of whether those individuals are outliers because they're really outliers or they're just flukes. Um, and since these are people who filled out those surveys, I know their name and their number, and I can get in touch with them. I don't want to throw them off of that result. But it's true, if you do throw them out, then the correlation is not significant. Absolutely. So all of the action actually is, what's driving your outliers? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes. If I could, you know, based on the sampling, with a sample, it was an R with your end of like 36. Really, you extrapolate that to an end of 330 to be representative of a large yeah. population. Right. So when you have one outlier in a sample of 36, that one outlier actually represents the 30 some you capture a population of 330 to be representative. So you actually want to keep that outlier in there if you think it's representative of a larger sample. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, great. This, I was thrilled that we can discuss statistics in here. Um, we will have a breakout session yeah. later. We obviously have a biased sample and all that stuff, so if we wanted to get really into it, we could have a really long discussion. Yeah. Uh, just one question. Yeah. Which University of Maryland is this? University of Maryland College, Maryland College Park. Oh, because yeah. there's like a half a dozen. I know. <laughs> um, and, and, and really the sad thing is, um, I'll just say this right at this point. The sad thing is it is a very restricted sample, so it's not representative of the real gaming world. Um, You've got the self-select bias. And yeah, the other deal is that we only had uh, psychology majors for the last six uh, semesters that the course was taken at the it, It's uh, restricted to people who are psych majors, so then you have only people who might be interested in the theory as opposed to people who actually game. Yeah. So then when you have those outliers, it's kind of like, oh, whoa, we got both. Yeah, and the other uh, caveat is this, this was during the actual semester. Gaming behavior is totally different during break and summer. And I would love to be able to make their graduation contingent upon filling out a summer game journal. <laughs> yeah, oh well. Um, yes? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I said um, at the beginning of the course uh, we had them rate themselves and it was uh, super subjective. It was out of 10 and it was how much do you think that you know about games, your, your, your knowledge. Uh, and then there's bias in there because we assume that some people are like, regardless of how much you know, you can do a ton compared to the next guy and it's, the ratings are different. And then so it was an average of how much you said you thought you knew about games and how much time you think you spend like, relative to other people playing games. So we averaged those two scores, and uh, people who got or rated themselves a seven or greater uh, were gamers, and those underneath the casuals. That's just how we had it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
but you can see based on uh, when we separate the casuals versus gamers in the charts, I mean, it's not an unreasonable distinction just based on the, the amount of the time difference. Okay, one more question on the quantitative data um, back there in the middle, female. Oh, just to follow up on his question, did you actually compare that to, the, to what they logged at all to see if, there was, if they actually assessed themselves correctly? It was when I was going through the data. So the answer to your question, no, but uh, they, they were pretty consistent with uh, the people who gave themselves like 10 on each. Those were the guys who were getting, guys or girls, who were getting uh, the uh, thousands. It was like, it, it was very consistent. There was a mix, but it was very heavily. You rated yourself high, and then you went and you played. Right. Okay, so now for the good stuff. <laughs> They're going to be so disappointed now. No, you're not. Oh, no, bring the hype. The ethnographic analysis. This is where we get into actually reading what they wrote. Um, so Caroline will talk about this. The first thing that she, okay, the first, what is an ethnography? So I'm an anthropology, I was an anthropology major as well as a psychology major. There are a number of different ways to do an ethnography. Generally, a complete ethnography consists of like participant observation, and then you do extensive interviews, and you do extensive background research. So this is sort of a very sort of messy and simplified ethnography, but it's very interesting to look at this data because I got to read all the journals. They looked at all the numbers. I got to read just everything from every single class. Some of it... Got to. To be fair, I thought I was very lucky to only have to work with numbers, but... <laughs> I got pretty good at skimming. Some people just did the same thing over and over again, so you don't really have to... Um, I was also a TA for one of the courses. I was one of those people who would take points off if you formatted it correctly, because I knew I would have to read it later. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, ethno ethnographic analysis, it's sort of used a lot in cultural anthropology to learn about cultures. It's basically an attempt to look at all aspects of the culture, get information directly from the people in the culture, and you try to be very dis descriptive and not prescriptive, so you don't judge people, you just try to analyze what they give you. So that is what I've attempted to look at some of the patterns and see if we can get some interesting stuff out of the journal entries. So. Um, this timeline, I have to tell you, is very simplified, and it was intended for an academic poster. If you don't see your favorite games on here, I didn't leave them out because I didn't like them. It was personal. It was, <laughs> it was, I put games in here that were mentioned in the journals. This is just to give context about what came out when the classes occurred. You can see those two big blue spots are the time period in which the classes existed. So you can see what games came out right before the class. You can see that the smartphones were just starting to kick off. People were just getting them. Um, so various famous games, Farmville, people actually played a whole bunch of Farmville. Um, I put operating systems in here just to give you guys a context of what was out. I'm sure some of you remember and can tell me, oh, you were probably wrong. Um, one of the other guys in the lab was like, that game was out in beta for a really long time before the official release, and people were playing it. And I'm like, I know, we're using the official North American release dates. Um, so as you can see, we have various, you know, the the tablets start coming out, we get more iPhones, we get more mobile gaming. Um, Angry Birds, all these really famous mobile games, Scribblenauts. Um, and you can keep going, because they probably know a bunch of this stuff. Uh, you know, various fa famous games. I like to put a lot of mobile games on here, just especially for the academics that we presented this big poster to. They're probably going to be more familiar with that than you guys will be familiar with all the releases, and you can tell me I'm wrong about things. Um, so this is Psych 445, is always in the fall, so we always get those Thanksgiving, Black Friday releases. Um, you get big bumps in playing, and you get people talking about going to midnight releases and that sort of thing, so we can keep going. Um, and then we have the Wii U comes out, we have, you know, new iPhone, new, various new things. I put, you know, Slender in there. Um, Tomb Raider, because that's one of Dr. Norman's favorites. <laughs> um, um, and then I made this chart um, for last May, so it doesn't have 2014 yet, but I'm pretty sure you guys all know what came out in 2014 and can probably tell me. 
Um, but we had the PS4 and Xbox One both come out within a week of each other, which was pretty interesting. So that's just some context for you guys, because just to remind everybody what was going on. Um, yeah, so we had, we had discussed the idea of writing up stereotypes, and would that be a really um, good thing to do or not as, as an ethnographer, coming up with these stereotypes, and so we thought that might be a bad idea um, for us to stand up here and label this type of gamer and that type of gamer. Um, yeah, and there's been so many people who've done it so many different ways already, and it's like, some people do it based on system, and some people do it based on game genre, and some people do it based on this and that, and it's just like, sort of more of a self-classification thing, so. So I thought I'd ask you two questions. What is the best stereotype of a gamer? Anybody got, the, you know, what is the best ideal stereotype? Yes. Greasy, smelly, Who would rather about that? <laughs> I mean, the most positive, the most positive to impress your parents. Those are the most positive. Okay, green in the back. The one that plays games with your kids? Yes, yes, excellent. Okay, now for the worst. But also, rude. Yes, okay. Entitled. Yeah, good. In People interesting. You can't tell the difference between reality and game because they're too immersed in the games. That's a good <laughs> Yeah, that's a good <laughs> that's way to that. That's a well made game. <laughs> yeah, we had actually, uh, on some of my surveys, I used the category check here if you're a hardcore gamer. And I've only had like three or four students over all these years actually check that. Not, not during the semester, I couldn't. Okay. Okay, one more. Anybody else? Yes. What were the worst things people said about Gamergate? Ah! Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'll have to say one, one perspective of my course is that I try, I'm actually not unbiased about games. There's a lot of psychologists that are very negative, that games cause aggressive behavior. Games do this bad thing and that bad thing. And the other side is a lot of cognitive information that games actually help people to be more uh, productive, problem solving, eye hand coordination, blah, blah, blah. And it goes through scores of studies that show the positive correlations between video game playing and cognitive behavior, social behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm actually not unbiased. I'm actually a little biased that video games are actually good for you. Um, and I encourage. Um, students to keep playing video games and to analyze their video games. Don't just stop journaling here, but keep thinking about why you're playing something, what you're playing, what you're getting out of it. The unanalyzed game is not worth playing. You should analyze everything, what, you know, all this sort of stuff. So, um, and it's not because I own stock in video game companies, but I do actually own stock in video game companies. So <laughs> yeah. There's always like one or two in the class who like come into the class and think it's going to be all about how video games are evil and then they actually meet Dr. Norman and then they realize they have to play two hours a week and they're like, welcome to your hell. Well, if, you have to understand that since it's an upper level psychology course, it fills up really quickly, it's really popular, people think it's super easy and then manage to get bad grades because they forget to do their homework. Um, but yeah, people like forget to play video games. They're they're literally that journal literally entries awesome. that say, oops. <laughs> like, the entire journal entry is, oops, I forgot this week. Um, but so there's always a few people who are like, oh, what about the negative things? What about the negative things? And it's really interesting because we go through, you know, the history of video games. We do talk about some of the, we talk about mental illnesses a little bit, but we also talk about how games can be used to treat certain things. Um, and basically we get into some great discussions about video games, so it's a actually fairly well wrapped class. Yeah, actually the, my, the most interesting entry that I had this last semester was the student during Thanksgiving break, because they have to do this during Thanksgiving break, of course, as well, said, 
she told, I had to tell my parents, I've got to do some homework for my class. And she then played her hour of you know, video games, <laughs> two hours of video games. Okay, so, um, so we thought we'd take a look at the types of sessions of games that occur. And uh, one of the interesting things that occurs in these journals are just the party game sessions. Yeah, so basically when reading through these journals, there's a lot of things you can try to make about types of gamers, but we're like, okay, there's not a really clear defining line, but one of the things we found that there were definitely different types of sessions, different sort of um, emotions that were evoked by different things. There was a lot of nostalgia gaming because we go through the history of video games, so people will go home, they'll get their old systems, they'll be like, oh yeah, I remember I loved this game when I was little, I'm going to play it again now, so you get a lot of really cool um, people talking about their favorite games from when they were a kid. Party game sessions were really interesting. For instance, you get people who only play, you know, RPGs, only play first person shooters, and then they go to a party, and every single person, I swear, will play Rock Band. Everyone. I'm like, I don't care how hardcore you think you are, you everyone down. likes Rock Band. It was weird at first, and then I just got used to it. I'm like, okay, everyone's going to play Rock Band, but um, sometimes people are like, how honest are the kids in these journals? And I'm like, they're pretty honest. Can we, yeah, it's nothing all the news. And it's kind of interesting that, that in some of them, video game playing is actually an icebreaker. It's a way to socialize, to get to know each other, to meet other people just by playing Mario Kart. And just to add one thing, um, is that with the grades, um, better, better than Mario. <laughs> uh, with the grades, um, as mentioned before, it was just based on the formatting as well as the amount of time. You did not get graded based on what you said, unless you said Doctor Norman sucks, whatever. No, Even that, 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 that okay. was an extra credit point. <laughs> oh, I missed that. I grade reverse psychology. <laughs> But yeah, people were pretty darn honest about their game playing habits. They would tell us that they got super drunk. They would tell us that they came home at 3 a.m. and played games and got completely trashed. Um, but so, you know, we went back to my friend's house and we played GTA and we sucked because our hand-eye coordination was terrible because we were super drunk, you know, stuff like that. Everyone loves Rock Band. Um, next one. Oh, yeah, this is cutting it off. The, the projector is cutting it off, but yeah, people getting high and playing Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Um, it's, it's an interesting, it's very interesting to read these sometimes. Um, I've heard great things. Yeah. But yeah, this guy was like, I still lost because they were all so used to getting high and doing this. <laughs> like, they've all beat me in. It's like the state dependent learning deal. And then there's binge gaming. What could that be? <laughs> yes. This, this is actually not a super great example of binging because the sessions aren't as long as some of the binging, but this is the most amusing quote I have, um, just because you can see the emotion here of them getting very, very frustrated with not being able to do certain things. <laughs> It would be hard for hard to read this with a straight face. So yeah, and the, uh, the great thing is the journal entry that comes like right after this is like went and played rock band with my <laughs> friends. <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> just got so fed up with wow, like, you know, go play rock band. Um, yeah. So yeah, binge gaming. It didn't pr necessarily produce the most interesting entries. One example I can think of is this guy who has always, always got points off for being late because he would start playing at like 10, 11 o'clock at night on Sunday and the game journals are due at 11.59 p.m. Sunday night. He would turn them in 3, 4 in the morning because he was just playing through and I'm like, dude, I still have to take points off because you were supposed to submit it by midnight. Sorry. We did adjust the system around that, though, at least for this semester. Uh, yeah, I, I realized that it? problem, so, so I put it at uh, 12 noon on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> to accommodate that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That one guy. Yeah, he okay. yeah here's, the, here's the positive side, family gaming. 
Um, I don't think we have any quotes for this one. Well, I did actually get a quote for it. Oh, you did? Okay, you grabbed a, you grabbed a quote SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> GameCube, 45 minutes. I was babysitting for this boy, Patrick. Uh, and this, this one was his favorite. So sometimes the games we play are dependent on what we're doing uh, with other people. So that's kind of an interesting entry. And then this one, Super Mario World. Super Nintendo, 30 minutes. My brother and I wanted to play the classic game. This was during a uh, Thanksgiving break, and again, kind of getting together with um, with other family members at different times. You play that kind of family game that they might have played in the past. I should mention one other thing. This past semester, we got into retro games um, a lot and talked about NES and, and uh, Super NES games. And in my lab, oh, I should mention also, uh, students are required to come into my lab and fill out various personality forms, interest forms, uh, and then play a half hour of video games. And this semester they have to choose among um, NES games and Super NES games. And then fill out some more forms. So there was this big discussion and kind of kids playing these old games and thinking about uh, retro gaming. So, yeah, so like, there's the party gaming, and then there's the kind of gaming where like, at Maryland you'll have classes, and then when your classes are done for the afternoon, you'll go back to your dorm, and sometimes your friends will be there, and you'll just start playing games, and so there's that kind of gaming where it's not really a formal arrangement with a big party, there's not generally drinking involved, but maybe you're just hanging out waiting for food, you're doing stuff like that. It's a very casual session that's not super focused. So we found that kind of pattern. A lot of the time it was a bunch of guys doing it, but occasionally they'll, there'd be just, you know, mixed group of genders, mixed friends, um, and sometimes it was couples. And so you'll see on the, on the right hand side, the undergraduates are getting younger and younger. That's where kids here. This is just a really, really great story that was in the journals. Um, it's not the best example of buddy gaming, but it's, it's fascinating to me that someone would actually write this whole story in there. And I couldn't fit the second entry, so I'll give you a little bit to read this. Um, he threw, his, threw the controller at the ground several times. Normal for him. <clears throat> but eventually yelled at me, threw it at me, and punched me as hard as he could. This was about three hours in, and I was in a foul mood. Um, I may have responded in kind, I may have thrown him off me, slamming him into a table, then I may have lost control and repeatedly hit him. Um, so the great thing is... <laughs> the great thing is the next day, there's an entry from the next day where they literally start playing the same game. The roommate comes in, sits down, and starts playing and acts like nothing had happened. <laughs> like, this, this entry, I'm like, is this real? Like, I'm not even sure, like, I, this seems almost fake to me, but it's also, like, the details, it, it's just so out of left field that I'm like, it would be hard to make up something this ridiculous. You're fighting over a Naruto game. <laughs> So it would be hard to make it up, but it also seems a little fake. So I'll let you guys decide the reality of this situation. Okay. So, so how many people have been stayed up for a midnight release at GameStop or someplace? Yeah. Um, so when uh, when the Xbox One came out and the PS4 came out, remember that? Did anybody go to the midnight Black Friday sale at GameStop? Well, <laughs> so I told my wife, who's not a gamer, that, okay, so for my course, I've got to get the Xbox One, and I've got to get the PS4, and so I'm going to midnight to pick up, you know, pick them up, right? And I checked they had them, yes, so, um, so I'm getting ready to leave, and my wife says, you're not going out at 12 o'clock at night to pick up some stupid consoles? I said, well, yeah. Okay, so I said, okay, fine, I won't go. I'll have my younger son go. <laughs> so, so she says, okay. So I give him the credit card and stuff, and he leaves. Um, and then she says, well, what if there's a fight that breaks out or something? Are you, are you sure what, you know, you just sent him out? What is he getting into? You go out there 
And by the way, he, he sends a text at that moment. There's a fight breaking out. <laughs> there's you get out of here and, you know, go with him. Protect our son. That's how manipulation works. Yeah. How old is your son, by the way? So, he's right back there. Uh, so he's, he'll be 21 in two weeks. Um, so, so this was great. I thought, how could this work out better? Uh, so, I, so I go, scan, get in line, he's there. Um, but as I'm walking down the line, what do I do as a psychologist? Which one are you getting, the Xbox One or the PS4? Which one is better? I started fights in line. <laughs> Right. So, so that's my story. Yeah. So, this is kind of it's a type of gaming session, sort of based around this midnight release. Um, people who wouldn't normally stay up super late will often stay up super late to just play the new game, play the get the new system. You know, they'll play online for hours. It's really tough to get up for work the next day. I wonder why. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this was 2011, Call of Duty, it's typical one, and same thing. Yep, Skyrim. Yes. How many people were there? And this past semester. <laughs> yep, new yes. Pokemon game. Pokemon. I love, I love the amount of detail about how he, he won't let her save. <laughs> He wants it done exactly as he wants it done. So there's um, also just kind of a lot of planned online sessions. Um, kind of really find a whole lot of good entries, but I've got a son-in-law who, like every Monday night, will get on with his buddies from when he was in college. Um, they live in North Carolina. He's up here. And so they just get on for a session of some kind of first-person shooter game, you know, and they're on their mics, and it's just, that's their evening, right? Um, and my daughter goes and sits in another room and does her thing, watching whatever, reading cooking books, I hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so how many people do that, have like a weekly gaming time? <laughs> She's a chef. Yeah, his daughter's a yeah. chef, hey, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll put a blog in, uh, a little, a little plug, plug for this blog. Uh, go to rampantcuisine.com, rampantcuisine.com. Um, she does the cooking, he does the brewing. Wow. Awesome. And they've only invited us over like once or twice. <laughs> you know, every Monday morning we look at their blog, it's like all this great food and all this great beer. And, stuff and <sighs> drool drool. <laughs> Here's the biggie though. Yeah, this, as you've seen from the timeline, the rise of the smartphone, we get better and better smartphones, more and more complex games, more and more people getting smartphones, more and more people playing the games, um, which causes session time to kind of go down, but number of sessions to go up because a lot of phones are not really ergonomically designed. You don't want to play that for hours. You're going to mess up your hands. Um, I mean, you can mess up your hands with a game controller, but at least they've attempted to design those a little better than most cell phones. Um, but so, we got a lot of different mobile gaming. Yeah, and you also notice that there becomes this increase in females in mobile at, gaming. At least in the pictures that you, that searched <laughs> on, you searched on Google Images. I think we've got data. Um, so this isn't as mobile, but it's the kind of session that you see in mobile games, and you can play this on your phone. But this is when Farmville first came out, and people were like, Farmville is awesome. This is before everybody got fed up with Farmville. 4 to 6 p.m. and countless other hours. The kind of data I can't use, thank you. Yeah, I, that's the worst kind of data. We give them a format, they completely ignore it. That's why I would take points off. Words with oh. friends. This is approximately actually... four to five hours collectively. Did not give me times. <laughs> um, this is where I tell my wife, 
you are a video game player. This is actually a digital game that you're playing on your iPad. And you're spending hours and hours doing this, late at night. You are, okay, I actually don't say that term because that video game player is an offensive term. But Words with Friends, wonderful. How many people play Words with Friends? All right. And this is the kind of journal entry I really don't like to read. Oh, wow. um, yeah, that's just, that's someone who listed all their little sessions, all their little 15 minute, and they didn't, they play like all three of those games each time, I'm really confused, but um, Dr. Norman also teaches a social media class, and some of the journal entries for that class apparently also look like this. Yeah, I do journaling, uh, and they have to write down every social media site that they go to, so how many times they're on Facebook, how many hours on Facebook. Addiction to Facebook. Oh my goodness. I want to get them on video games. <laughs> Not Facebook, except Farmville and Wild Blast. Um, yeah, so these, these become kind of interesting sessions, and they actually get into an idea of uh, cycling through games. Um, you're, you're on Sims for a little while, then you get knocked off of that because of time or something, and then into um, jelly Splash and then Candy Crush, and so you cycle through. How many people kind of cycle through things like that? Okay. I mean, if, if Subway Surfer threw me off, I'd be cycling, but I just stay on my surfboard. I think they're only in line, right? Yes, only when I'm standing in line, uh, wherever. Yes. I wonder if it's, it's not going to be all of it, but I wonder if part of it is because a lot of mobile games nowadays have like that premium format where they only let you right. play for a certain amount of time, right. or so, you yeah. have to like either pay for more or wait for your Yeah, for getting your lives back from Candy Crush or whatever. So, so essentially, the, it's kind of the game mechanics and the, and the way that they're marketed free to play and, and the sort of pay to play through. Um, is changing the kind of entries that we see and the way, the habits that people are having. And that's kind of a scary thing for us psychologists, that we are trying to intervene and change people's behavior. The video game industry is figuring out ways to do that through getting you, you know, attracted to a game, playing through that game. But their reason for doing this is not to, um, our good reason as psychologists to be therapeutic, to help people live better lives, what is their motive? Money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm proposing to my clinical psychology friends that they actually don't charge money anymore. <laughs> Doesn't work. Psychology kind of does the same thing. Sorry. Um, but I think we're a little bit more in the helping profession than they are. Uh, so if you're interested in this research, uh, and more of it, because we do a lot of different things. This is just part of it. Um, you can go to the website, lap.umd.edu. It's uh, memorizable, short term. Um, I asked the university to give me all three letters. So we've got, it's great, just nine letters. Uh, the second one is Realms End, uh, umd.edu, edu, where you can go to actually fill out surveys on video games, on video games and emotions, video games attractions, uh, things like that. Uh, and if you're interested, you, here is my uh, email address, klnorman at umd.edu. Okay, should we get some questions or we'll just kind of discuss things among yourselves? Yes? Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you said that there was some correlation between video game habits and personality. Can you deliver more on that? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we actually did um, a project, um, myself, actually Bradley who's sitting in the audience over there, um, another friend of ours, Christina, and we looked at a couple of different video game genres, uh, racing, fighting, what else did we do, dancing, I'm missing something, FPS. Um, and then we picked two games from each of those genres, um, games that we thought were representative, but obviously, you know, it was kind of subjective as well. Um, and then we had people come in, um, undergraduates, mostly people from Dr. Norman's class, we had them come in for 
was it two hours? Yeah. Yes, it was two hours. I, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you run any? They get course yeah. credit. Okay, these, these people are, are nice. That's great. But anyways, um, so they came in and they played one of each genre of game. We randomized it so that you know there would be an equal likelihood that they could get the one or the other. And then we ran some correlations. We found that there was a correlation with um, agreeableness and extroversion with um, how much someone liked a dancing game and uh, how easy it was for them to play it. So the higher the uh, extroversion or agreeableness, the more they liked um, or found the dancing games easy. We also found a negative correlation between conscientiousness and first-person shooter enjoyment. Okay. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, we, those were the only correlations we found. Um, we're currently um, in the middle of kind of doing some more with that. They also found out that I'm terrible at racing games. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> Big research finding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yes. Wait, back there. Yes, yeah. um, I know that you do your research on your students, but I am curious about how the casual gaming, especially on phones and whatnot, how and what type of game and how long will play a role for families with young families, or even from as a Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so most of my research is actually correct. It's on students at the University of Maryland. Um, in the class, I also require a project where uh, students get together in, as guilds. Okay, let's call them guilds instead of groups. Um, and they're required to essentially develop a survey and get that survey out on the internet and have that filled out. So that's a good question for us to, to think about in the future. The whole thing of mobile gaming is like huge and the idea of, um, of it being used obviously in social networking but, but also in family networking. Um, and I think in the next few years it's just going to be really, really fantastic to see the kind of development um, as there's a merging of video games and social media. They've become, I mean, video games are creating the social media links on the one side um, through connections between DS's and uh, Street View. Then on the other side, the social media are saying, well, what do people, how do, how do people relate to each other? And it's often around entertainment and gaming, so they're putting that together. So there's almost this weird kind of mer convergence of the two things. Okay. Yes? Have you thought about doing game journals for like con attendees? Because this is like another type of like game setting. <laughs> yes. So does that mean that you're willing to fill out game journals? Yes. Yeah. 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 So raise your hand if you would be willing to fill out game journals. Oh, there you go, mm -hmm. Dr. Norman. There's also land parties. And the land parties, yeah. yes. Right. Yes. If, you, if you sat people down and say, you know, this is our special group of land, and we'll reserve a slot for you for four hours if at the end of the four hours you fill out our game journal. Trust me, places like here, you know, you, you promise them a, a arcade game or a land game and say four hours, guaranteed time, they'll fill out anything. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I just need some government yeah, funding like, to do here's this. Five bucks, here's my survey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the thing with uh, the students so is they're kind of a captive audience and like we can, we have sort of a really good incentive to get them to do it each yeah, time. Yeah, but, but, but games, okay, situations like that incentivize filling out surveys. Um, mobile gaming and lots of games can incentivize that as well by saying, okay, you can play through Candy Crush, whatever, if you fill out the survey of your journal or whatever. Um, the difficulty, I, can, I don't have too much of that difficulty with, with my students knowing that they're going to be honest because they know that, you know, I'm going to give them a bad grade if they, uh, if they falsify their journals. But if somebody is just doing that for a purpose, they also have to really, you know, be honest about those journals. So that's kind of the difficulty. We, you know, as Carolyn said, we're, we're pretty sure they're being honest with us because there's a lot of negative stuff in there that they yeah. just wouldn't make up. 
you get some social desirability by a bias. Right. Uh, but it's a good thing to think about. I'll think about that for next MAGFest. Or there's several other, I wouldn't say genre, genre conventions, like yeah. Taxicon and Auto Budokan, that have large video game components, not just right. MAGFest. Yeah. Yeah, then I, it, it's interesting too, it'd be wonderful to do it, kind of be the uh, sample bias on the other side, you know, other side, but a very, very interesting group of people to, to know. Yes, way, way in the back, and that'll be the last question. So speaking of the negatives, did anybody seem to have problems regulating their gaming? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the most extreme case was this... Um, Korean girl who wanted to play a beta release of, I forget what game it was, it was only available in South Korea. She, in her journal, said that she contacted somebody to get their passport number, et cetera, et cetera, to, to log in to this beta version. She was so bleary-eyed because there's a time difference between here and there so she was like up, pretty much up around the clock, just putting in hours and hours and hours into that. Um, yeah. So there's, there's, you know, I get some of these individuals in, in the class that are just like over the top. Um, fortunately, she curved that quickly uh, and got an A in the class. All right. Okay. Well, um, just kind of the last encouragement, uh, just kind of the personal thing of. You know, personal game journaling, even if it's on a piece of paper or whatever, think about what you're doing, you know, weekly in your gaming, um, whether it's extreme or non-extreme. I mean, it's okay some weeks not to play a game. Right. But sometimes, I mean, one of the things I encourage is to play a diversity of games. If you're playing the same game all the time, there's something funny about you. <laughs> You should, you've got to break out. You're not a very diverse person. So, you know, sample the different things that are out there. Um, obviously, you know, I've got to sample a lot of different things to know um, the different genres of video games. You guys should too. Um, if you're just one fix on one game, um, you know, and that's, that's okay. Um, you know, some people just want to watch football, and that's it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but think about the games and think about how it's affecting your life uh, and make sure that it's doing it so in a positive way. All right, thank you very much. Amen.